I'm Kevin, and <clears throat> I just spent a lifetime, instead of doing other things, <laughs> studying these various subjects. And we're gonna, we're, and this won't be so much of a, as a talk as it will be a discussion. And I'll plug in where silence reigns. So, um, welcome everybody. My name is Michael. <clears throat> I've been hanging out here for about 13 months or so, and uh, I really love it here. People and atmosphere enriched, and I'm grateful. My name's Marilyn, and I'm also a member of Happen for quite some time. Don't really know how long. And uh, I just want to echo what Nancy said about friendships made here, including one with her. <laughs> and uh, here's our secret. I'll tell our secret. We start talking in here one night, and I see there's this really pretty lady with Kevin. And, we discovered that we were in the same high school biology class in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds? 1970. What are the odds? Yeah. 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 So you meet amazing people here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm top member a long time, but not as long as you. Is that a segue? I'm Steve Smith. <laughs> 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 I haven't said that. I told, I told Kevin earlier. Um, a conversation with somebody in my church about two weeks ago that was shamanism. And they knew quite a bit, and I knew this much. Uh, I'm wise now. I know enough when not to go too far. I said, well, he's speaking two weeks. I'm going to come here and just open my heart and take it all in. You can do that here. And that's what I love about this place. Whether it's here or out in the garden with somebody, it's all here. And the wisdom library, take your pit. The world's your oyster. Here we are. I'm done. You went too far. You <laughs> <laughs> shut me up, but you didn't. Uh, make up for you. I'm Steve Smith, member about 10 years, and I really apologize for this hat. I do have an excuse, so. I do have better manners than this, but. Here? Well, I'm not a new face. I think this face is like 64 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I've been a member, I think, maybe one year less than Steve. And uh, I'm happy there that my two guests have been able to come. Thank you. Yep. So these talks have been going on for about eight years, uh, pretty regularly every now and then. Something comes up where city clubs closed for uh, whatever reason, for the <coughs> New Year's or Fourth of July, and or something happens to me, like get a bad cold or something. But other than that, it's been a consistent series of talks for for that long <clears throat> and sometimes i wonder what the next topic will be because sometimes i feel like you're running out but last time we had somebody here said they were a shaman and they're not here tonight so i thought well, okay we'll talk about shamanism so <clears throat> like any subject or any um area of study in i mean we call them the western mysteries but they're more pervasive than that <clears throat> that's just as an anchor that uh, there are certain elements to subjects that um, find their roots in almost every tradition in some way or, or fashion. And it's certainly true with shamanism. We can go to particularly any ind ind indigenous culture, and that's more where we'll, you tend to find them and our sort of thought forms and relationship with shamanism tend to be more around indigenous peoples than they are about somebody who might be uh, an urban shaman, if you will. Although there is a book called The Urban Shaman by Gabriel Roth. But uh, so we have this idea that uh, that there is a certain indigenous nature to that. And so I try to find a, a reasonable picture that might capture the essence of shamanism, but most of them were very unkempt individuals with feathers or in trances or full of ash. And, and I thought, well, I'd like to capture something <clears throat> a little more... Um, I don't know, essential. Um, so I, I, I actually chose a picture by um, Mr. Gray, the artist, and it, di it didn't get used when it went into the uh, newsletter. But so there are certain elements. And before I start talking about what I think the elements are, I would be curious, because you're here because you're interested in the subject. Some of you may already have expertise, and you may be a shaman yourself by certain standards. So I'd be curious as to what your sense of that is. What is a shaman? I might say that, I guess, Cynthia, 
seems to um, have intuitive powers. Uh -huh. And um, they have surfaced on many occasions. Mm -hmm. So, Cynthia, you're put on the hot seat here. <laughs> So if you would like to finish selecting your tea, or would you like to chime in? Um, or both? Stress, really, I'm stressed now. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to put pressure on you, so you have to do it. No, It's up to you whether you want to chime in or not. No, not yet. I'll, okay. I will when... Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll fill in while she's working on the tea. Yeah. It's kind of an intermediary between the benevolent and malevolent spirits. Is where I'm just, I've got a Wikipedia... Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I see an intermediary in a sense, but a lot of it revolves around uh, trances, around ceremonial. I mean, to your earlier point, uh, I go back to the Russian side of Tujik, is that what it's called? Tujik? And then the Inuits and the last. Uh -huh. All these cultures have. Your own form of sure, the indigenous cultures from around the world. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. oh, we we had a hand over here with uh, Michael. Um, in my view, shaman, a shaman is someone who can journey through realms of consciousness that are not of the normal. Okay. Peter. Yeah, it seems like a, a shamans, whether they're in. You know, whether they're in Mexico, let's see, I remember being in Oaxaca where the shamans would get the, uh, where they would have the psilocybin mushrooms and they would answer the people's, people would go there with questions about where their son had been or their daughter and, they, and they, what was going on and the shaman would try and answer or whether it's in other parts of South America, maybe Ecuador, they sort of try and bring bring some answers to people's lives and maybe assist them with, with different uh, answers that otherwise they might not be able to figure out themselves. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm not a shaman. <laughs> but, um, but I have worked with them. And, uh, and so all the shamans I've worked with have been, and I've written an essay about one, actually. Um, all the shamans I've worked with, though, were like, not only do they have contacts with other realms, I'll just call it similar to what Michael said, is not, not normal things, that, the unseen, um, but they can help those of us who can't do that easily actually both travel there and, and guide us through what's happening there. And um, the shaman that I wrote the essay about, I don't know his name, but it was the shaman that Chief Naiwat went to talk, went to get advice from when the gold seekers showed up here in October, October 17, actually next week, um, in 1858. And um, he told him to leave. And his, um, his, his colleagues, I, you know, that's the wrong word, but anyway, wanted to, wanted to wage war. And he went to the shaman and asked for advice. And so the shaman went into another realm and brought him back advice. And from that advice, Naiwat decided that peace was the only way. So, um, so I see them more as a guide between us and other realms, and they have this ability to go there. Well, uh, Michael, did you say that shamans have basically, paraphrasing, an awareness that you called not normal? Would a shaman say it's normal in their awareness? We'll, we'll, we'll answer that question. I thought we would. That was a baited question. I want to make sure we're going to go there. Don't, don't, don't let me forget. No, I won't. Because that, that was important. I wanted to sure. kind of follow up on that. Yeah. Any, anybody else have any comments about that? We have two hands back there. And you're pointing. Okay. You're on. Sure. Um, I think that a shaman has a sense of reality which is not locked into place as in the one that's shared by most people in their realm or even in their society so it's it's a lot less perme a lot less fixed a lot more permeable and they can kind of reach in and bring out these larger modes that might not make sense for everybody who is locked into 
providing a foundation, providing sustenance for the tribe. Like whatever, whatever that is outside of consensus reality, a shaman can take in and bring back. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that which they're bringing back is like different from the shaman itself. Um, but in, in my experience, it's, it's like the aspects of society that won't fit but need expression. That's, that's why shamans are created. <clears throat> Anybody else want to make a comment? <clears throat> so, what do you, uh, Dominic, were you going to say something? Yeah, no? I see that. <clears throat> My sense is that it's uh, somebody that <clears throat> has shed filters, certain filters that was not in our culture, that has shed uh, protective shell, and that is in uh, touch with some other realities, mm -hmm. and that help other people to get in touch with those other realities. Okay. So, there, is, is anyone kind of picking up an element here about what we've been talking about relative to shamanism? There's a certain what that, that is constant throughout all, all these <coughs> points of view. Unusual and, capabilities? Well, unusual capabilities, but let me, let me uh, step back from the, the world of shamans <clears throat> and take an occult point of view and uh, the word occult <clears throat> basically meaning that which is hidden from view. And so occultism as a subject has gotten a bad rap from a lot of the ecclesiastical institutions. But fundamentally, um, it, it is really examining those things that are the causal factors for what we see here on the physical physical plane. So there's one word that kind of chimes in, and that's ontology. And that's the, the science of being. How do you exist? And the shaman deals with a certain ontological frame of reference. We all do. From, from, from where we are, we sit and we see, okay, we're at this table and we have a nice chocolate-covered strawberry here and a piece of chocolate with nuts in it. You know, we're, that's the physical aspect. <clears throat> um, and there may be some kind of an emotional charge or identification with this shaman aspect. If some of you ever worked with one, you might, you know, send yourself back to that point in time where you felt some energy from that. <clears throat> and that could be perhaps more uh, of an emotional, ontological experience. And then others have, have, a, have a mental framework about that and maybe the technicalities of it. And so then there's the mental ontological aspect of it. Then there's something that even exists a little higher than that, which deals with, with the true idea from, from a point of view of definition and and. and and a scientific approach of what intuition actually is. There's the intuitional plane, which is transcendent to the mental. And so you have, right now, we just threw out four ontological planes. The physical, the astral or emotional, the mental, and what we might call the buddhic, or uh, the intuitional plane. Um, a shaman, in the indigenous sense, tends to go into the ontological area of what is we call the astral plane, or the emotional nature. And it deals with a particular subject that's called the signatures of nature. That the, everything in the manifested world has a certain signature. And that signature is connected to the earth. And, and so the shaman can go in and read the signatures and can begin to identify with um, what Rupert Sheldrake, uh, who's a biophysicist, called morphogenetic fields. That's a very scientific explanation for something that is a phenomenon that indigenous peoples have been employing for thousands of years. So there is this, it, it's a phenomenon, and it is, uh, from a particular point of view, otherworldliness, but we all participate, at, participate in it in some level, and at the same time, we may not ha uh, focus our attention on that or develop the capacity to penetrate into that particular uh, area of reality. We, we might skim the surface of it because we, are, we have physical bodies, we have emotional bodies, we have mental capacities, and occasionally are able to tap into this buddhic or intuitional 
uh, ontological plane. So we all can get little smorgasbord, if you will, tastes of these different areas, but we don't necessarily live there or reside there. And neither necessarily does a shaman, but they know how to get there if they need to. And so, um, for Steve, you talked about being uh, someone who deals with negative entities or forces or... Uh, intermediary, yeah. whether it's to uh, the spirit, malevolent or yeah. benevolent. Sure. Mm -hmm. And others talked about uh, uh, Chief Naiwat and going into this place of talking to a shaman who was able to bring back information. So <clears throat> there is this aspect of shamanism that goes into a plane of existence and brings back information. We can do that. Um, some of you, the DEA is waiting outside for those who have done mushrooms and <laughs> all <this. laughs> So a, a lot of us have tried altered states of consciousness, whether it be through Psycho, uh, psychoactive substances, or um, a, a particular type of work that Nancy's involved in uh, is, is achieving an altered state of consciousness through the breath. Uh, so we have uh, various uh, psychotherapists too, like uh, Wilhelm Reich and Stanislav Graf, and uh, a lot of our 1960s heroes, Timothy Leary and Lily and so on, who went into these altered states of consciousness to help somebody overcome some issue. And, and so whether you've used uh, psychoactive substances or whether you induced a state of an altered state through, through the breath, you're actually uh, beginning to participate in that shaman experience for yourself. Because frequently, that is exactly how a shaman would go into that altered state. He would take a psychoactive substance, which kind of gives you a, um, a free pass into an ontological plane. <laughs> And it, it, and it gives you an experience of what that's about. And, and then you come back with information. So here's an experiment that um, I've tried, and I would recommend anyone to at least have a go at it, and that is to go into an altered state with a specific question. What is, you know, what is death? What is the ministry of death, for example? What is that whole concept of the... The idea of the of the breaking down of forms and the resurrection of the life that exists within that form, or what is it for that life to come into a form? Uh, those are really heavy duty questions, but you can have a direct experience of what that is. Um, and then on another level, uh, you might want to just find out um, there's somebody who's coming into your life, and you want to be able to figure out whether that's a good person to allow into your life. So you might ask a shaman or you might ask an astrologer, which in some ways is the same thing. All of these aspects of going into different ontological planes is a form of dowsing. So has anyone ever done any dowsing before? <clears throat> because there is, and this deals with what, I, with what I talked about earlier, what is called the signatures of nature, that this whole reality we call the earth and, and, and the whole cosmo, cosmos is filled with information. And how do you want to access that information? So being able to access the information is, in a sense, that shamanistic path. Now, <clears throat> we, we tend to identify with, um, you know, maybe a Native American shaman, or if you have studied uh, uh, the Hindu tradition, you see the sadhus who walk around usually naked and they might have a pitchfork and, you know, they, they look like crazy people, but they're constantly going in and out of these worlds. Um, or the Ban in Tibet, who were the indigenous people before Padmasambhava came in and brought Buddhism into into Tibet, and they and they still use the Ban. Uh, there's a if you, you've ever seen the movie um, Kundun, <clears throat> there's this one scene where they have one of the indigenous peoples, and the Dalai Lama is sitting there, and this guy's in his altered state of consciousness, and he's giving them information. So it's really about accessing information and dowsing or using your personal vehicle, body, your uh, emotional nature, your mental nature, or whatever, as a, as a vehicle to douse. And you can use a pendulum, you can, or you can use a psychoactive <clears throat> substance, but it takes you into that place. And the fundamental element of shamanism is gathering information. And how do you want to go about doing that? Do you want to have someone else become that person to do it for you, and they go into a trance, or they... Uh, go, uh, are able to, they know how to go into that state, maybe without taking a psychoactive substance, perhaps through meditation or breath or something like that. So you see that there's this 
principle or fundamental element of that thing that we call shamanism that uh, is available to everyone. The question is, do we want to take that road to be able to access that information? Or what is it, what is, what's the cost of being able to prepare oneself to do that? So I'm kind of throwing that out, and maybe we'll open this up a little more for further discussion. Tom? I have to comment on the housing. I lived yeah. in northern Vermont before I came to Colorado. And I had a housing manufacturing company with two other fellows, and we sold it about three states. In my experience, I and mean, there's a lot of houses that went in the ground, um, I never found anybody in the, welling, in the well drilling business in northern Vermont that would drill a well without it being doused first. Mm -hmm. And then I got to know the dowsers. It, it's called Danville, the dowsing convention every year is held in yeah. southern Vermont. And uh, they would tell me not just where the water was, but how deep it was. So I sat there, skeptic initially, waited. Sure enough, he said 11 feet by about 10 feet, I'd start getting wet. By about 11, the bucket's bringing up muck. And it happened every single time mm -hmm. yeah. for three years. Just every yeah. time. Okay, I've said enough. Okay, so that's tapping into something uh, that is in the world. This, and here's an example <clears throat> of this concept of the signatures of nature. The animal kingdom, which lives instinctively, okay, we live intellectually, fundamentally, there's two grades of distinction. We also have instinct, and we also have intuition, which are two different things. But in the animal kingdom, the, the, the animal life is naturally connected to the signatures of nature. And there was an experiment done with a rabbit, and the rabbit runs around and feeds on the, on the grass and the plantains and whatever's around the, the area. And then there's this plant, deadly nightshade. And it walks up to the plant, sniffs it, and it knows that that's poisonous. And it doesn't eat it. And it goes around and eats the other herbs that are located around, and it's, it's totally aware of this. And whatever level rabbits are aware, it knows that it can't eat that. However, if you take the rabbit and you remove it from the, the earth and you put it in a hutch and you cut the nightshade off and you put it in the hutch with the rabbit, he'll eat it. Because the plant and the rabbit now are disconnected from the signatures of nature. So we, on some level, because of the path that humanity is on, which is the development of the monastic principle, which is the principle of mind. We have to, that's the path we're on. It's a very dangerous journey because we build things that can destroy the world in the process. But on the other side of that is, is Bodhi or the Buddhic plane. That's, that's the plane that the plane of mind leads to. But in the process of doing that, we sort of turn our back on this instinctual aspect or the signatures of nature and we kind of lose touch with that. And so we are, in, in a sense, in that same perilous position that the rabbit was in when you cut the plant and you take them and put them out of the, the field, if you will, of the signature. When you talk about this, go ahead. We talk about the signatures of nature. Aren't they all basically energetically based? They are energetic. Every yes. signature, right. every plant. What's that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and right. you have to throw that in there in between the words. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. it's true. And, and at the root of shamanism, isn't there a connection with energy fields that many of us are just simply not aware of. We just haven't tuned ourselves to them. And those energy fields, how you get access through those to other realms, <coughs> I'd like to know some more about. But mm -hmm. there are certainly people, children, for instance, that are very, very young children, very receptive to uh, the energy given off by various elements in their environment. Now, is that what you're talking about? about that, that, that is... A, a, it, fundamentally, it's, it's, once again, it's information. The, the whole cosmos is constantly beaming information throughout, in every direction. The center of information in our system is the sun. And it may be difficult to, to perceive the sun as a living, breathing entity that actually is the life-giving principle for everything within its system, and that it has died and reincarnated and will die and reincarnate again. <clears throat> But it is constantly streaming <coughs> forth information, but not just information, but also probes to find out what has developed far enough along that it can begin to have a direct contact with. So there are substances that the sun beams forth that the alchemists were aware of, and they give them different names. 
then they pass through your body a trillion times a day. And they read, how's this, how's this person doing? Uh, a little dim just yet. And over a period of time, they might pick up some, something satisfactory that, 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 that the sun can read as, I found myself in this form and begin to identify and communicate. That's a type of information, and, and that, that's a kind of development. There's also a lunar aspect um, that, that deals more with the astral, as, astral plane or our emotional nature, but they're all energetic fields, and they all exist on a certain ontological level. So the physical is sort of like the, the buck stops here. It's the end of the road, the density of the form. The sun beams forth light, but the densest form of solar radiance is gold. For example, it, it is, doesn't tarnish, it shines like the sun, and it is the one thing on this planet that has probably been deemed the thing of value for as long as um, we have been able to recognize that it was something of value for millennia, for ages. Um, it doesn't tarnish, and it kind of, when it is passed along in various areas of the world, life, life unfolds. It's like the energy of the sun brings forth abundance like water does. You see, a, you go through a desert, and water flows through. There are trees and grasses and oases. Um, when money or that substance, which is basically a condensed solar radiance, finds its way into a community, there's education, there's the arts and sciences and, 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 and peace. And when it's held back, you have war and strife and all manner of, of difficulties. So just think about that particular aspect and why it is that certain areas tend to be flamed with, with war and, and, and anger and hatred and other areas are not. So once again, it's that information process and the spreading of that solar energy throughout the world. And when it is released in a, on a level playing field, then all these other suffering things that we deal with will eventually go away. The shaman tries to find that in little micro clusters. For example, there's a tribe and they're having difficulty whether it has to do with the, their hunter gathering thing or the crops they're trying to plant. Um, and they try to deal with that issue here. But there's a larger context that we can operate in and you don't necessarily have to um, take an LSD trip or take psilocybin to, to see the energetic pattern. Um, I, I met this one guy, he's a, a Peruvian shaman. He got his PhD in agriculture from Greeley. And we were at this conference and he said, I've learned all that stuff and it, it's of no value. He says, well, I'm gonna plant my crops. I get a guinea pig, I open them up and I see which way the li liquids are flowing and how things move. He says, then I know what I need to do. <laughs> he said, all that stuff I learned in my PhD has not helped. And I go, wow. You know, he's still using augury as a means to uh, to determine how to plant. So there, there are these energetic informational fields that we can tap into. Steve. It's a bad habit of mine, I know. Um, I always try to look for, I'm, I'm open to magic, open to intuition, all that. But I always look for scientific, to your point about the PhD, of uh, scientific or physical or physiological explanation, just taking your rabbit example, <clears throat> could it be that through natural selection, the rabbit, when it sees this, what do you call it, wild root, whatever it's called, flower, in its natural environment, is poisonous. The ancestry, just by natural selection, those that ate it died, etc. right? Mm -hmm. But when it's cut and put into the rabbit hutch, it doesn't have that association. Wouldn't that be one explanation for? Sure, that's an explanation. Um. <laughs> in, in, in intuition, because I've always felt that it, intuition seems like magic sometimes, yeah. but maybe it's just a subconscious way to um, manifest information that is not consciously uh, available. For instance, a fireman, fireman, no, they have an intuition of whether a, 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 a building is a, which is on fire is going to collapse if they go in it. Mm -hmm. So they don't go in to certain areas. Yeah. And they say, well, it's magic. They have this intuition. They just know. But it really turns out it's just through just through just past experiences. Okay. Let me, let me pick it if you're done. I don't oh. want to cut you off. Um, first of all, there's a huge distinction between 
instinct and intuition, okay? Um, firemen are trained to assess the situation. And when they go in and they see a certain condition, they say, well, that's not going to be safe. So there's a scientific piece. But there's also this sort of other sense that we have, whether, like, danger. You know, the, the hackles on the back of your neck go up and you know that something's up. Um, but to, to say that it, intuition is magic is, um, is only giving a name to something that we don't understand the principles that are working behind that whole phenomenon. And, and that's a difficult thing um, because in a lot of conditions, we don't know that we don't know something and we also don't know that we don't know it. So if, if, when that condition exists, it's like why would we even ask the question? Because we have no uh, capacity to even be aware that such a condition exists in the first place. So coming from a strictly scientific point of view and needing evidence, that your, your questions are absolutely valid. And um, well, I'm good, thanks. And at the same time, uh, if we look at those <clears throat> who we consider to be uh, spiritual leaders or the wise or whatever, <clears throat> someone like the Dalai Lama or a, a great a great guru or a teacher or maybe someone in the West who's developed um, certain ideas, and they presented themselves in a way where we begin to respect their opinion and say, well, they actually know something we don't. And how did they get to that position? And so that's something that would attract my attention if somebody seemed to be aware of something and it seemed to be correct. <clears throat> but if, if you try to just use reason and logic uh, and you look at the world situation and, and the things that I just described, you know, it, you don't have to go into the Buddhic plane to recognize the difficulties and the potential solutions to the problems. So there are, there, there are the higher levels of consciousness and there is what our capacities are at the moment to, to perceive and then to act accordingly. And I hear you and I understand that and I accept that. I'm just saying, I just responded to that one example you gave. Yeah. Saying, I, can, I can't understand that from a non buddhic plane perspective. Sure. But <clears throat> no question about it. I tell my kids, if you're in a situation that feels uncomfortable, act on it. Act yeah. on it and don't question it. Don't yeah. try to explain to yourself. <clears throat> Um, Aaron, uh, Tom, Aaron had his hand up. I want to. Yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. I have a question I want to ask you, but first, just a comment. Uh, I, I've been um, uh, maybe in just kind of a casual way interested in this topic for a number of years and have read some different things. And one of the most striking books I've read on this subject is called The Cosmic, Serp Cosmic Serpent by a Swiss uh, scientist. <coughs> named Jeremy Narby, and he takes you through his journey as an anthropologist hanging out with uh, some indigenous folks down in the Amazon basin with utter skepticism at first. And I think it's one of the reasons this book can be so effective and powerful is that his skepticism is so clear. And then his, his experience and, and how he gets convinced that indeed there may in fact be these realities beyond what our so-called logic and reason might uh, be able to approach or describe or understand. So anyway, The Cosmic Serpent's a fantastic book. If it's not in our library, I, I, uh, I would, would suggest that it, it could yeah. be. I have a question, and I want to ask this referencing, I think, another great thinker who's approached the subject of shamanism, uh, Aldous Huxley. And, you know, he wrote Doorways of Perception. He wrote his dystopic uh, novel, um, Brave New World, and then he wrote his utopic novel, uh, Island, which is a fabulous read. And I'm rereading it after, you know, this is maybe 20 years ago I first read it. And I recently asked myself, would I, would I still get a lot out of this as a quote-unquote grown-up? Um, and in, in <clears throat> Island, in his vision of the future, he, he, I think, is engaging in a thought experiment where more people within a given community or society are engaging in shamanistic practice. And one of the things I'm wondering about, Kevin, is when we look to past indigenous cultures, it seems that one of the patterns that's pretty consistent is the practice of shamanism tends to be only a select few people within a given community. And I wonder in the context of the evolution of human consciousness, which is something that uh, we tend to enjoy discussing, I think, here at the City Club. Is there potentially something to be gained, something to 
come forth in these times where more folks within any given community might engage in this sort of practice. Yeah, and, and it's being done. Um, <clears throat> the Soviet Union, uh, the former Soviet Union, when they were going to work on a project, uh, for example, a biological uh, research, they would have build a city, and they would have 30,000 biologists all living together in this community researching a subject, one subject or maybe uh, several subjects related to a single point. <clears throat> and they would develop all these amazing um, ideas around this thing. Uh, one of those uh, had to do with um, the microwave spectrum. You know, we, we had read stories about how the embassy in Russia, they would be microwaves and our people would get brain cancer. <clears throat> well, there was back in 1996, um, a friend of mine <clears throat> uh, asked me if I could help him get some funding to bring three Russian scientists over. And what they had were these microwave technologies, but they spent even as far back as Stalin's time they said, well, if you can kill people with this, you can heal them with it. <clears throat> so this one doctor in particular developed uh, these healing techniques using microwave technology. And I had a couple of these devices, which I eventually gave away to some other doctors, but one was called an AccuVision, and you put a piece of like cellophane on your arm, you turn the lights out, and you run this uh, machine up your arm, and it illuminates all the acupuncture points. You can see them. Okay, And it was a, it was a diagnostic tool because the pathological points would show resistance and they would stay uh, lumined longer than the non uh, or the healthy points. And then they had this other machine that would radiate milliwatts of energy into that singular point without even puncturing the skin. This this they were doing, you know, back in the uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Now they have these devices they can actually implant, you know, that emit, emit these pulses that help balance the body. The point here is that there is a, there are energy fields. That, that when they're um, brought up to a certain level can kill or they can heal. Hmm. And the same is true with, uh, with, with the frequencies that are around us. Um, you know, you talked about uh, this idea of a collective operation of people working on a particular idea. <clears throat> Rupert Sheldrick, uh, who I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, a biophysicist, <clears throat> he wrote a book with Matthew Fox. It's called The Physics of Angels. And Matthew Fox talks about the nature of the soul and the information that is attendant to that. And Rupert Sheldrick talked about the same phenomenon, but he used the term morphogenetic fields. And so together they, they made a presentation, one coming from more of a religious point of view and the other from a scientific point of view, talking about the same phenomenon, but using their own uh, language to describe it. And so when we, when we find people get together and they begin to focus on a particular problem, with, with the same goal in mind, uh, it accelerates the capacity for that particular issue or subject to come to resolution. That's what happened during World War II when you had all these scientists come together trying to uh, split the atom and create a nuclear weapon. They were able to work together and, and wrestle. And, I'm, and I say wrestle, the, that information already exists it's on the higher aspect of the mental plane or even into the buddhic plane. And when a group of people get together, they can uh, invoke, if you will, and bring down ideas and thoughts that will bring things forward on whatever subject you can imagine. But it takes the massed intent of, uh, and focus of, of individuals and they can begin to bring down, just like a shaman might do that on one ontological plane or another, a group of scientists not only are capable, have done it over and over again, and not necessarily aware of the energies and forces that they were employing to accomplish their objective. Almost a gestalt. It's like a gestalt. A, it is, yeah. It is a gestalt. Consciousness uh -huh. or ability beyond the sum of the parts. There. Yeah. But in, in some of the uh, <clears throat> esoteric texts that are the more recent ones published in the last hundred years, um, they talk about the, the, the new science, or the way things will go, is a group of individuals working together, and will accelerate that. So the Nobel, Nobel Prize comes out, and maybe somebody gets a prize here in the United States, and somebody else they don't know, because they're very secretive about how, what they're doing and their funding. They're working on the same project, come up with the same information on different points of the globe, but because their work is finally recognized, they each share in this prize, and they're not even collaborating with one another. <clears throat> Because sometimes an idea, time has come, and there's a collective uh, 
rotation of thought that goes around creates a vortex and brings that information to bear on those that are willing, and I'll use the word suffer, <laughs> to get that information. So question on suffer. Um, in terms of um, the path of individuals as they evolve to become a, sh a, sh a shaman, um, at least in Western society, is it common for those people to enter what Steve called <clears throat> to embrace and enter the malevolent energies to release that so that they can... Um, so I'm just wondering, in, in terms of the training or just the, the way that... Is there a theme there in Luke, terms of... The dark side. The dark side. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. In, in, uh, I'm a shadow work facilitator coach. Yeah. So I've been doing shadow work for many years. And almost inevitably, when somebody... Uh, embraces a really troubled shadow in themselves, something that they haven't wanted to know. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know that they it was there. Sure. They didn't even know that they didn't know. Um, it, almost inevitably, they fall into light. There's, there's light that mm -hmm. comes out of that. And I'll bet you the same thing happens through the breathing. And, um, and mm -hmm. out of that light, for some, I think comes uh, an ability to intuit to kind of know what they didn't know, maybe not totally intellectually, mm -hmm. but to attract other kinds of energies to themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it, it happens. Yeah. And uh, it, it actually happened to me early in my career and was a pivotal turning point in my life. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's a, it, in order to be centered in such a way as to be in touch with those kinds of energies, does it mean being able to for shamans, shamans to be able to enter that kind of space to release that energy into something more golden. Yeah, and, and, and it is uh, uh, the consequence of not being trained or being unaware of what's out there um, can be dire. Mm -hmm. And many shamans, or even, we can even move out of shamanism, but I'll say a spiritual teacher who might in some level be a shaman because of their capacity to meditate and make contact with certain energies and forces and information, uh, can do amazingly wonderful work and at the same time be sexually abusive, take advantage of people's bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I, I, and forgive the term, but no matter how elevated certain individuals are, they seem to be able to maintain certain assholian qualities. <laughs> And 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 it's it's <laughs> and and it and it and it, it, it never seems to fail, and it's very rare that you'll get somebody who is so far above board that they're able to have that discrimination to know that that's not allowed. And and I'll share a shamanistic experience I had one time on using uh, a very large dose of psilocybin mushrooms, and. Um, this, uh, so I'm sitting there, and it was going to be, I thought it was going to be kind of a fun evening with ha-has and all that. And that's before I really got to understand the power of what's there. And all of a sudden, this angel comes up to me and grabs me by the shoulder and takes a flaming sword and sticks it in my heart and says, now that I have your attention, <laughs> I have some things to say. And for about an hour, I got this whole download of information about what is called spiritual incest, where a spiritual teacher takes advantage of students. And then when it drew, I drew the sword out, it was kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi fighting Darth Vader, you know, when his lightsaber goes, blah, 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 it starts getting shrinking in power. This big flame just shrank to a candle wick. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to go out. And it didn't. <laughs> but it was, a, it was just a wick. And the angel said, your wick is lit, now go teach others to light theirs and beware. Whoa. That was it. Whoa. So those things happen. And... But we need to be, remember, once you start going into a place where you can influence people, there are consequences of abuse of power. And that happens more times than, than not. Could I just speak a little bit to the, <clears throat> you were, your languaging was, I think, around the shaman has the power to infuse someone else with light or to enlighten them kind of thing, the guidance. I wasn't going that far as much as to um, sync up with the kind of energy that allows that person to, that individual to 
kind of know what to do or where to go right. to draw energy into. But it, it's yeah. getting rid of the dark, not getting rid of the dark side, but it, it's understanding the power of the, the shadow in this kind right. of work because yeah. fear, fear is underlying. I mean, you can imagine, I imagine shamans, shamans must go, get pretty scared on the process of their own evolution, you know, because mm -hmm. they sense that power. So, and anyway, that's what I was talking about. Okay. I, 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 I really, I just wanted to yeah. send home the message that we all have that within us yeah. to heal and to yeah. move into these altered states and um, gain for ourselves what it is that we need to further our own evolution. And so, and we'll shaman is a guide, yeah. and guide. boy, when that person can really own their power, that's where I think the real magic happens, the shift can happen. So I just wanted yeah, to... Well, that makes perfect sense. Okay, thanks. Done. I have a question for you. Back to Steve's question about physics. Um, I could imagine somebody, a physicist, thinking about quantum entanglement, that particles at a fundamental level have been moving together for so long that they basically share information immediately. We know that much. It's a stretch to say that we are that, but some have been arguing that, and physics is going there, I think. So some physicist, well, going back to my question, who, trying to figure out who couldn't be a shaman? In other words, somebody down at Los Alamos, been there for 40 years, they have this aha moment. They get that. They get the intuition. They know it. They know who they are. Can are they on a shamanistic track? Where where do you have to be to be a shaman? Well, that's that's why I wanted to address not the a lot of the glamour that is around this, the shaman, but the elements of shamanism itself. <clears throat> because shamanism is is if is going into another state of consciousness on some level. And we all have the capacity to do that. Some of us can do it through meditation. Others need a little boost um, to get to get there, using other substances, things like that. Or, or a vision quest, for example. Um, one can go out and deprive themselves of of a lot of the like mm -hmm. water and food, you know. And that that sense of desperation, or going into a sweat lodge and finding yourself on your knees because the heat is there. It gets so intense that you would like to be out of there, but you don't. You stay there. Or doing a sun dance. It's, it's when someone brings themselves to the limits of one of their ontological areas of existence, and they're aware of that, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental, uh, there's a trigger that occurs that can catapult you into the next level. And, and you begin to experience it. So everyone has the capacity, or let's say uh, could have the capacity, Sometimes that capacity needs to be developed. It's just like, you know, if somebody who is adept at uh, financial matters and knows how to knows the the way to make money, they just know how to do it. Other people, you know, they they're having trouble balancing their checkbook, and they would like to do that too, but they don't have the capacity. Mm -hmm. And so you can build that capacity through training and knowing what to do. Um, but at the same time, you have to uh, recognize where you are, where you want to go, and what are the tools I need to get there, and then understanding the elements of that, then there are certain things you can do that will give you the tools or transform the way you perceive reality and eventually enter into these states. Brad? Yeah, sorry, I just had a question about <clears throat> these altered states and entering into them and, and how to get there, I guess, as an adult. But um, just thinking about the perception um, <clears throat> that can happen in those states and then <clears throat> in some ways... Um, as, as a child, as uh, someone who's very young, um, like I used to, my wife and I would always joke about this, I have a daughter who's 10 now, but when she was like five, she would pick off our brains like crazy. You know, we, I still remember this example because we'd bring it up to her, kind of laugh about it, but um, she got a, a book for her birthday that, that my mom gave me, and uh, my mom told me about it, of course I hadn't, hadn't told her about it, and she just came up to me one day, she's like, Dad, are we gonna read a book about a duck tonight? which was exactly what the book was about. Um, there were many times where this happened, and, and somewhere along the line, she doesn't do it nearly as much now. Um, my son, maybe every once in a while, and, and hardly ever anymore. And it just, uh, we would always think about this, and we're like, you know, why is it that they're able to do that? What kind of connection do they have at that point, being so young, and where is this lost? And where do you need, you know, if this is some kind of um, 
shamanistic quality. I mean, it's kind of hard to say as a, as a child to have that quality, but some kind of uh, um, being in touch with that altered state or that consciousness at that age and where that's lost um, as we get older through society or the norms of yeah. our world. Um, it, it does happen, and, and children tend to have this sort of innocence, and there's no um, filters or boundaries that are built yet between themselves and the other and, and other worldliness. And I've seen that in my own two boys. When, they, when we get a little older, we get enculturated. Uh, certain resistances are, are built into our system, uh, and certain capacities that we have maybe even as a, an 8 or 9 or 10-year-old uh, are discouraged. <laughs> and this is a really bad example, but you remember uh, the uh, uh, Eddie Murphy movie, Dr. Doolittle, <laughs> where his, he's communicating with the dogs and the minister comes in and the father introduces him to the minister. And I think he's like seven or eight and he goes up and smells the minister's butt. Oh. Because that's what that's what dog the dog was teaching him, right? Correct. And of course he got <laughs> in big trouble for doing that. But the point was, for a period of time, that whole capacity that he had disappeared until one day this dog comes up and starts talking to him and then it all goes back there. Dominique? You do find that uh, children and uh, art and <clears throat> just when you were talking it just came to my mind is uh, art a certain way of uh, shamanism and you find that in art I don't know how old your kids are but up to 10 you know their art is wonderful. I mean, they're talking about their drawings, their paintings. It's spontaneous. It's tapping on something else, and then it becomes self-conscious, mm -hmm. becomes torn apart, and then they conform. Right when they get into twelve years old and so on. And you look at the art of artists like Matisse or Calder or Picasso, and you look at their work, and there's a childish quality to it. There's no filter. It's all out there, the tapping from somewhere, and it's not compressed, torn apart by the culture. It's just another way of accessing the reality. And they, and they find that. I mean, they, it's, a, it's a whole life work to find that kind of spontaneous expression that is unfiltered. You know, you find this as yeah, well. I'm thinking about the, the dancers of Matisse, you know, the, the canals. Mm -hmm. well, they did those just taking a, I mean, taking a, a, a <coughs> uh, scissors and just cutting those forms. Mm -hmm. well, it's like, a, and it's not they're, not, they're not proportionally right, but they, they tap into something that is so much deeper, so much bigger, so it resonates. And that's what we feel when we see a Chagall or Matisse or Picasso. It's like that. It's what they call expressionists. Well, they said it takes a, the art, one of the artists that you were mentioning said it takes a lifetime to learn how to paint simply, mm -hmm. to go back to that childlike openness. You know where you yeah. see this? It's with people with Alzheimer's. Late stages of Alzheimer's, people are already back. To early childhood, the art changes, becomes much simpler. The use of color and light is uncomplicated and connected to something that most of us would have to go to class to learn how to do again. You know, so in in our middle years, you know, to 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 reclaim that part of ourself, um, it just brings me back to the question that I could ask more simply. With people that become shamans, do they have to cross the Rubicon to reclaim that part of themselves that they've lost? Well, um, there's probably a certain element of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's just, you had a question or a well, comment? The question or comment is that, you know, going back to these stages of early childhood and, and recapturing simplicity and purity. Um, I mean, these are these are still within a human concept of simplicity and purity too, and it's like, yes, there is, there appears to me to be like value in that and reclaiming this jumping off point where you can develop these abilities further. But most of the most of the aspects of these archetypes that are celebrated in this culture are just that, like a connection to a unified vision in its nascent form. In its, its simplistic form, and then 
it's my understanding that the shaman sits and lives in this open state and then develops it further in ways that maybe other beings don't have the field or the um, receptivity to dive into, such that the return to a childhood, like a return to um, that, that innocent state, is like the lowest common denominator that everybody can see of these processes, of, of, of this field. It tends to be the most talked about, but also a doorway and not necessarily much of the room beyond. Is, is that uh, so. sufficiently clear? Like it, I, I think, that, I think that's, that's a good uh, explanation. I, and I would like to bring up an, another idea relative to this. And each and every one in this room has studied a subject of some kind and have taken on some kind of endeavor where you have become, quote unquote, an expert in that field of some type, or have at least a highly developed level of skill. I have a friend who's a woodworker, and he's so into the wood that he actually identifies not only with the tree that it came from, but has an awareness on how to handle the wood, uh, how to cut it, how to dry it, how to be, you know, and all these myriad aspects about this piece of wood. And most people will never know about that. And if he w would see somebody doing something that is against the the, the, well, I could, could use the word grain, uh, you know, we can use it, but um, he would like try to tell them, but since they have no capacity to understand the level that he's coming from, it's like, I want to just cut it. Um, and so that often happens with our particular areas of expertise. There's a certain amount, uh, and I'll use the word suffering, not that, that that has to be the word, but in order to get to that place, Sometimes you really have to focus so much to the point of allowing other things to fall by the wayside. And a shaman does that. And or whatever it is that you have chosen to do in your career, there's this all of a sudden this laser focus takes over and things on either side of the spectrum tend to fall away and you become aware of the essence of the thing you either you're trying to become or the thing you're trying to learn. And that is in a sense uh, contain, contains one of the great elements of shamanism. So whether you're identifying with this thing, a subject, or an ontological plane, you have you have the capacity to enter into that very rarefied domain about that subject. Um, and not to cut us off, but just to let you know that it is 1.30. Those that need to leave, I know Peter, you've got a tight schedule, but um, we're... We can stay and chat a little bit longer if you like, but I just wanted to not hold people or have them feel like they're missing something, If uh, and you will miss something. <laughs> <laughs> I have a follow-on question to that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> one of the things... See you, Peter. Thank you. Bye, Peter. Um, it seems to me in our culture we are we are hyper uh, technological at this point, and so much of our collective attention is directed into developing more refined, smaller, faster, more powerful technologies. Um, in many cases, because we can, or because it seems there's a, a profit imperative or motive behind it, but it seems a lot of these things we're doing maybe perhaps we shouldn't do and I'm struck by uh, your story of the guy who did the PhD in, in agriculture up in Greeley yeah. and is growing food a pretty fundamental thing it seems uh, and it, not using that hyper uh, technological yeah. uh, uh, set of knowledge that was developed and is developed and, and so like back to my earlier question of would it behoove us as a, a species at this point in time for more of us to be get, engaged in shamanism? Because it seems there's a, a wisdom and an intelligence that comes through that that says, hold on a second, we may not want to just charge headlong into continuing to develop these hyper technologies. It may in fact not be all that wise. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I'm curious with so many of us and with such brilliance focused on hyper technology how, how do we think about, as a society, having more widespread and infused wisdom, if you will? Well, wisdom, wisdom is a consequence of knowledge. Uh, knowledge is the raw material for wisdom. And wisdom is the right application of knowledge, i.e. lovingly expressed. 
and the consequence will always yield a wisdom. And <clears throat> to look at technology, the, the, the jury's out on a lot of that stuff. Some of it has helped us tremendously, and, and some of it uh, may not necessarily be so helpful. But if we, if we begin to look at the evolution of shamanism, you know, maybe we're no longer going to be walking around with an with a oyster shell and, a, and an eagle feather and smudge people with, with sage. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm saying that there may be something else besides that. Um, <clears throat> but if we examine the elements of it, then we can begin to take the elements of it and make them um, conform to the to the times, or make the times conform to the elements, and be able to practice shamanism in a way that is uh, relevant to to our way of being right now, because it is the elements of it that make things happen, and not necessarily uh, all the trappings that come around our concept of what shamanism is. You know, there's the regalia, and, and then there's the singing, and all, all these things may be helpful and may induce a particular kind of condition. Like in the Sufism uh, tradition, there's the zikr, and it is a form of indigenous shamanism. There's a body, their body prayers, and there's chanting, and then there's a movement of the hands, and there's and you have the circle going around, and people are like getting into this whole thing, and there's an ecstatic state that is collective, and then it's released, and then all of a sudden there's this collective experience within the group. Now you can take those elements and apply them to how can we improve life here on earth? How can we relieve suffering in the world? Is our technology doing that or is it creating more suffering? Isn't the short answer to that question though? Yes. <laughs> the technology is whether the technology is a servant or a master. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it a tool or is it a yeah. Mm. That, that, that's a good part, but remember, because the question is also about shamanism, and so remembering the elements of it, and then applying that question. Uh, <clears throat> in masonry, there are, three there are three major tenets. There's the cultivation of truth, even if it means you have to let go of your pet paradigm, whatever it is. Cultivate the relief of suffering in the world, and the establishment of the familyhood of humanity. Those three things. And so if anything that we engage in is not supporting is it true? Is it relieving suffering? And is it cultivating the familyhood of humanity? Anything outside of that is questionable. And that's that's uh, those are the that's those are the yardsticks or the measuring devices. And then there is the elements of of shamanism that can be brought to bear on those areas, whether it be technology or the food. I mean, is the food the way we're growing food? Be able to feed the world with poisonous food? Well, that's not so good. <clears throat> that doesn't helping humanity. One of the things I, I hate to use the words positive and negative, but one of the things about technology that I, I see when you're talking about when you're talking about this, Aaron, and I thought I probably just lived in Boulder too long, but it feels to me <laughs> like the world is embracing this in a way so much more than they ever have, and I think the technology is a big piece of why that is. You know, the, the, so, like I'm, an eco, I'm fundamentally an ecosystem scientist. So when you go into ecosystem science, you learn two things. There's this, like, this is the, what, the way the world works. And they, and they actually missed a key one, I realized. So they say, energy flows and nutrient cycle. That explains everything. There's a third one that they missed, and information compounds. Right? That's actually why the universe is expanding faster and faster. That's why human knowledge is expanding faster and faster. And so this, it, I don't know, it, that's a useful comment, but it just feels to me like that one of the uses of technology is for us to be able, maybe we don't need the smudge sticks anymore, maybe some people do, but, but people are learning about these things and, and able to read about many of them and know about many of them and find ways they can do this and that they couldn't before. You know, so, so, and some people can get there just through meditation. Like some people are just close and whatever the sun is sending in those signals, I don't know how it works, but there are definitely people that are tuned in, tapped in, you know, and getting it. And, and I think the acceptance of this, the technology, one of the good things about it is that it's giving us a way to do that. And it's fascinating to me that a lot of the technologies in the world that are doing that were even though they may be used for profit, well, okay, fair enough, people should make money. Um, that's not what, that was usually not why they were created. 
they were usually created out of just pure interest. It was like, can we create a better way of searching for information? That's, in, you know, Twitter. Can we have fun? Facebook, can we have fun? Those were just people trying to have fun. Well, it's a tool. And it's become something really useful, I guess. I don't know about Twitter. <laughs> it, brings us to, it brings us to a point, I think, about making and really asking those three questions, for instance, yeah. from a more informed yeah. place. It yeah. just enables, yeah. a, it builds capacity to ask those questions. Yeah. No more having to carry around your 40 volumes of the Britannia. Exactly, exactly. Or, there's a question yeah. on there yeah. on the corner. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when, when we do apply the three questions to it, what is technology doing right now? Is it facilitating our search for truth? Yes, because it's putting all of the world's libraries together. Now, we, we have to cite, um, figure out which truth is actually true. You know, that's, that's, that's another question, and that could create suffering as well. Is it creating a family of men? Yes, and it's also perhaps creating second lives where we present our best face forward on Facebook but may hide an inner life. So it's like, what, what is the question of, of the development of suffering? And I think that's where the evolution of consciousness comes in. I mean, because we evolved for communication. That's why we're the dominant mm -hmm. species on this planet. And now we're in an area of hyper-communication. Mm -hmm. And technology can either be used to... Um, in my experience, my direct personal experience, you can use it to, to open up to more people or to deaden the suffering by engaging in like little socially remunerative behavior, but like not necessarily bearing the full self. And it can relate to increasing anxiety too, because your entire social circle is now right at your pulse. You know, there's there's very little privacy. So it's like it seems like technology could actually be driving evolution forward to the people who are willing to endure the suffering of always being examined all the time. That if, you're, if your inner self is examined all the time, you can either work all the harder to close up or just open it up and transcend the boundaries of consensus self. And thus, for most people, they'll be lost in on ever more reified and rarefied distractions such as Huxley mentioned in Brave New World or Bradbury mentioned in Fahrenheit 451. All the dystopias focus on the distraction from reality aspect. But for the people who are willing to be open and aware, it seems like technology can facilitate a huge increase in the pace of evolution because you can no longer get away from the presence of other, the omnipresence of other. In, and the like the the field, like everyone's watching. So so I I love the the brilliance and the intelligence with uh, what you're sharing and saying, and I think I agree with what you're saying, but to me there is also a huge question, and how is it if we believe that the these communication technologies are actually enhancing our evolution as humans? How is it that we are at our hands with the Anthropocene? Uh, the orchestrators of the six great uh, species die off on the planet that we know of. And how is it that we have more slaves on the planet right now than ever before in history? These are questions I just, I do think that there's an element of complete distraction and even narcissistic distraction <clears throat> at play that works really well with apparently shareholder returns. And I don't mean to beat that drum too much and I'm not disavowing profits and capitalism per se. I do think though these systems can get really good at moving and accumulating different forms of capital, human, natural, and otherwise, in unintended ways when we're not actually looking beneath the hood of what's happening. And my, my concern having kids and lots of friends who are young parents, par parents of young kids, is that most of us aren't even really thinking about some of these big existential questions we face right now on the planet all that much. And, and it seems if some of these things are true, uh, climate change, species die off, collapse of rainforest, collapse of fisheries, we ought to be thinking potentially about these things a little bit more than we even are at this point. Aaron, isn't that why the big debate right now, one of them is AI. Yeah. And one campus scientists are going, makes sense, the other campus going, are you out of your mind? Yeah. The filters haven't been, our awareness to society hasn't gone up enough to be able to filter them at a higher level now. It's just more data. Tool versus master. So if we're going to run into a ditch, 
sooner than later, maybe that's what happens with more data, because you haven't discerned yet. You haven't decided how can you use this information to the betterment of man, or this is, or actually not man, Earth, everybody, including species die off being one example of maybe not doing it all that well. Most likely people don't make a change until it's, there's devastation, until yeah. right. we reach that point. And then, you know, well, whether or not we can... A cult mean culture? Or what are you speaking about? When you the say global, people, this global. planet, people, uh, humanity, people as a whole don't do anything <clears throat> until we reach such massive points of destruction that 9-11, everybody came together for a minute. How long did that last? Until the media distracted and us. And when, and when people start to really, you know, this is a great conversation, and how far are you going to take it? Are you going to take it home, and are you really going to go inside and see within yourselves and ourselves how much we can shift our own consciousness to help aid those who are not yet there? And I think that's where the, what, the rubber meets the road. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we can talk all day long and possibly make some change, but when you get up, I don't know, I'm not, you know, a power person in all the political world, but those powers that be are pretty powerful forces, right? And so, um, yeah, maybe I, I'm going off, I'm no, well, sorry, we, we Actually, I'm all the subject was shamanism, and, and, and we're now we're, we're trying to figure out, and this is a worthy subject on how to deal with saving the planet. And, and there are, they are connected, but this is probably a good place to draw the conversation to a close. Yeah. And if there are any volunteers who would like to suggest a topic for next month, I'm open to hearing that. I was going to say technology. I suggested this one. <laughs> What's that? I suggested this one, so somebody else take a turn. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you can send, send something in to me, or I'll probably wait for Ellie's... Uh, email on the Wednesday before the news. What's the topic, Kevin? Well, you, you raised something that I think would be worth a What's topic. I, I see you, you mentioned something earlier in this conversation I think would be worth following up and on. What was that something? Uh, it had, <laughs> you talked about a collective action, collective consciousness, okay, collective sure. focusing energy collectively and where, mm -hmm. what are the forces that come into play sure. in that? Okay. Well, you know, because I think it also addresses that feeling of helplessness that right. some people feel when they, what can I do to change? Well, it's only going to happen collectively. Mm -hmm. as, as a culture? In uh, as a community, as a institute, as a society, you know, what, at, at every level, okay. it seems to me, the only way we can, we're going to break the cycle of waiting for devastation. Yeah you know, is to foster dialogue in right. useful, right. creative ways. And I'd be interested in what kind of energies come into play in sure. that, that maybe yeah. we don't normally address. Right. I'd be interested in that as a topic. Great. Sounds good. I'll, I'll see if I can craft a topic around that subject. Great. Well, thank you all for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you.